Open your Bibles, if you please, to our text for uh, today. It's found in Matthew chapter 1. No, this is not Christmas. But we're in Matthew chapter 1 today. And I'll be reading from uh, Matthew chapter, uh, I mean, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 18, all the way to, I believe it's 25. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to divorce her quietly. But just that when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife but had no marital relations with her until she had given birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. The Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father God, we are here. We're thirsting for some word from you, O Lord. Please be with us. Fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, um... As we read through this text, you probably noticed the background uh, picture there. Did you notice something? It's probably hard to see because of the words. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and take the words out. I'm just going to show the picture itself. Do you notice something? Do you, know, do you notice the halos? You notice Mary's halo is so bright and Baby Jesus' halo is so bright. And then you notice Joseph's piddling halo. Joseph's piddling halo. It seems like that is a standard in, in most, most nativity scene, where all the glory, all the limelight seem, you know, seems to, uh, to gravitate around the mother and the son. And Joseph pretty nearly gets left out. If he is recognized, he never speaks. He never says a word. He seems to just always be there quiet, just doing what he's told. No fuss. As a matter of fact, only Matthew mentions his name in the entire Scripture. And in the other retelling of the story of the birth of Jesus Christ, that would be in the book of Luke, in the gospel according to Luke, Luke does not even mention him by name. As a matter of fact, here's what he, he comes close. The closest um, that uh, uh, Luke comes to mentioning Joseph's name is here. When the eighth day came, it was time to circumcise the child. And he was called, Je- he was called Jesus by who? Matthew tells us it was Joseph that called him Jesus by instruct, as instructed by God, the Father himself. And Matthew at least tells us it's Joseph who names Jesus, right? Um, and Luke omits that altogether. And even in the succeeding um, uh, narrative of, of Jesus' birth and after Jesus' birth and, and so on, and Jesus was at the temple and Jesus... Uh, you know, getting lost 
after a while, after a few years, he, he gets himself, you know, lost in, in Jerusalem and leaves his parents, be, uh, uh, and, and his parents leave Jerusalem and he stays behind. And, and Joseph is not mentioned there by name, at least. And Joseph disappears from the map, it seems like. At least Matthew mentions him by name here and spends most of chapter 2 describing to us some of the things that, that Joseph did for his family, for his young family. He shows up two more times in, in Matthew chapter 2. Um, that scene where they escaped to Egypt and then that scene where they return to Egypt. And in both cases, um, Joseph is there quietly doing, do, doing what he's been told to do. That's what fathers do best, it seems like. They're called honey-do list. And sometimes, you know, we, we, we seem to... Um, you know, construe um, Joseph as this, you know, boring guy, somber maybe even. I mean, I mean, Matthew does not even give him a quote. He doesn't even get quoted. There's nothing here in Scripture that tells us what he said or what he might have thought, how he may, may have felt. Maybe, well, there's a little bit here in our text. Joseph is mostly somber, boring perhaps, not like some of the characters in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in and around the, the birth of Jesus Christ. What about Zechariah, for example? We heard about Zechariah, the doubt that he had when an angel comes to him and, at the temple. And then because he doubts, he gets muted out for a, few, for a few months. And then when his son, the precursor of our Lord Jesus, John the Baptist is born, he breaks out into eloquent speech, and we even have that quote. We even have a couple paragraphs of, his, of, 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 of what he said, but not Joseph. And then, of course, we have Mary. Mary, who, you know, when, when this, the, the, the angel of the Lord announces that she is to become the, the mother of, of the Messiah, she breaks out into a song. And that song has been recorded as well as the Magnificat. And even Jesus, baby Jesus in the womb, he even leaps for joy. Can't wait to say something, perhaps, you say. And yet Joseph, well, Joseph, he's just there. His halo flickering a little bit, piddling halo. Joseph, stoic. Joseph just there quietly doing what he's been told to do. No fanfare, no speech, no song. But Joseph, of course, is no robot. He's, he's, no, he's no robot. Jesus must have felt something. Could you imagine what must have gone through his head and what he must have felt? Um, or how she must have felt when she realizes that her fiancé is pregnant and he knows for a fact it wasn't him. Could you, could you imagine the, uh, the sense of betrayal and the conflicting emotions he must have felt when he realizes that the woman he's about to marry, his fiancé, and by the way, in those days, you get, when you get uh, betrothed, um, it's as if you're, you're, you've, you're married um, without, of course, the consummation of the marriage that happens at the wedding. And so he knows it wasn't him. Joseph must have felt really, really betrayed, that sense of betrayal. And yet we are told that Joseph, even as he felt betrayed, perhaps, by his fiance, he feels compassion for her. That feeling of compassion is right there written in the text that we just read because he knew that if he publicly acknowledged that, 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 that his fiance is pregnant before their marriage, that it would have been death to Mary. Mary will have been stoned to death 
for being an adulteress. So quiet Joseph decides to divorce Mary quietly. Yes, in those days, fiancés divorced each other. Or at least a man can divorce his fiancée. And last, our scripture tells us that Joseph felt afraid. I mean, who would not have felt afraid? His life was crumbling in front of him. And his hopes and dreams dashed. And yet, he was not a robot. He was a man. He was a human being. And he had feelings as well. You know, it's very easy to misjudge quiet persons as insignificant and trifling. It's very easy to overlook them. Um, They're often overlooked. The world loves charismatic people, charismatic men with personal magic, and someone who can arouse passion, someone who can, can you know, arouse passion and loyalty and enthusiasm, someone that people can rally around perhaps, somebody like maybe like a Winston Churchill who can utter words and uh, who, can, who can harness an entire language and, and send them into battle and, and stuff like that. Someone who can hold an audience um, um, spellbound with their eloquent speech and command their respect with their, with their force of presence, of physical presence. But you know, the saying, there's a saying that goes, calm waters run deep. And it seems to me that Joseph was that man. Calm waters run deep. And calm waters hide a wealth of wisdom, of experience, and faithfulness. And just as calm waters are run deep, so Joseph, it seems like, was that calm waters. Just what God needed, it seems like. For the most crucial time in the life of this, the history of this world, with the arrival of God's kingdom, as had been promised by God the Father through many ages, the arrival of God's kingdom on earth through the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And that he picked this quiet man, this Joseph, to be husband to Mary and father to Jesus. The world, it seems to me, has enough eloquent men. But the world is in need of simple dads. Quiet dads. The world has enough charismatic people. But the world seems to need more. Quiet dads. Dads who don't mind having a piddly halo if it means wife and children get the limelight. It dawned on me that if God had given us an opportunity to pick a husband for Mary and a father for Jesus, we probably would not have picked Joseph. But God saw in Joseph what we often miss. Calm waters Run deep. God saw in Joseph this quality. And no, Matthew did not, did, did very well, as a matter of fact, portraying Joseph as not saying a single word, not getting quoted. There's no quotable quote about Joseph, what he said. Joseph was simply a quiet and a good dad and a good husband. And that was more than enough for God to pick him over others who could have been Mary's husband and Jesus' dad. Because dads don't like, often don't like to claim credit for their kids' luster 
they often turn to mom and say, I had nothing to do with it. It was all my wife. I was having a text conversation just this week with uh, Brian over here, and uh, I found out that uh, Ben, you guys remember Ben? He was just a teenager when I first came here. He's going to Berkeley now. And he's going to be pursuing applied physics. Pretty smart fella. And so I, as we were texting each other this week, me and Brian, because he showed up at my friend's church, and my, friend's, my friend texted me and says, do you know this, these guys? And I, I hope you didn't take it too seriously when I said, no, I don't know them. <laughs> I texted back my friend and said, no, I don't know them with, a, with an emoji. And um, Ben is headed to Berkeley. And so I congratulated this, this guy right here, my friend, and this is often characteristic, characteristic of, of dads. He claimed no credit for Ben and gave it all to his wife. I fancy myself thinking that God picked Joseph before he picked Mary. I mean, that's not biblical. I don't know that for sure. It's just me kind of thinking on Father's Day weekend that it must have been so. It must have been so. Because, you see, to have a good family you need, the foundation of that family is the dad. Isn't it? A good dad. So I fancy myself thinking that God picked Joseph before he picked Mary. And I'm thinking, yes, he must have a loving husband, a good father. And of course, I'm biased because I am a dad and I'm a a husband myself. And for one day in a year at least, we fathers can indulge ourselves perhaps thinking that way. But uh, tomorrow, well, actually tomorrow is Father's Day. So the day after that, we go back to our old selves being like Joseph who didn't need to claim credit for what he did. He just did it because he was a good dad. He was a good husband. And God honored him. Of all people, he honored Mary, but he honored Joseph first, it seemed to me. And as we read the the scripture that I read today, you find two things here, especially that is so um, amazing to me, and and the way God speaks so tenderly to Joseph in that dream, or the angel of the Lord speaks so tenderly to Joseph, acknowledging his fear by saying, Joseph, don't be fearful, don't be afraid, it's going to be all right. You see, the promise that I made long ago about bringing salvation to the whole world is about to come true. And, the king, and my kingdom is about to arrive and you're about to be the father of my son. And so he says, do not fear, Joseph. You're in good hands. Do not fear. And then he calls him a name that nobody's probably ever called him all his life. He calls him son of David. That's royalty. He calls him royalty, not simply because he's a descendant of King David. There are many descendants of King David. Not every single one of them can be called son of David. When you're called son of David in Scripture, you're a king. Or at least an heir to the throne of David. And God recognizes the faith and the decency and the humility of this quiet man and calls him son of David. And then he does even more than that. He says, you're going to be the father of my son. I want you to name him. He's going to be your boy. 
He's going to grow up, and his, and his lineage will be traced through your lineage. Da Joseph, son of David. Even if he is the child of the Holy Spirit, he will grow up and he will be called Joseph's son, your son. And you must raise him for me. You must take care of him. You must protect him, he and his mother. And you must do everything you can to give him a good name. And that's what good fathers do. Away from the limelight. Comfortable in the little halo that we're given. Because the halos belong to our wives. As they should. And to our children. Who will grow up to be greater than we are. And it's okay. As a matter of fact. I can almost hear Joseph if Joseph were to show up here, and maybe, he's, I don't know, maybe my imagination is getting the better of me again. Do I see Joseph in here? What would he say if he sees that picture now? And he sees that his halo is about to be snuffed out. I could almost hear Joseph say, take the halo away. It makes me uncomfortable. I just did what my father told me to do. And come to think of it, perhaps God picked Joseph because Joseph was most like him. A father who does not want any credit for to himself who lavishes all the credit to his son and to the earthly mother of his son, Mary. And Joseph did what he was told. He loved his wife and his boy. And he protected his family with his own life, risking everything, running away to Egypt, coming back from Egypt. That's what dads do. They protect their own. And he raised his boy to be just like his father. His father down here and his father up there. You see, dads don't need halos. We do better without halos. Give the halos to the mothers and to the children. Just give us a bottle of root beer. I brought some here. It's for you. Dad's root beer. Once a year, we can pat ourselves in the back. Let go of the piddling halo. We don't need the halo. Just a bottle of root beer, maybe. Are you ready for the root beer? We even chilled it for you. It's chilled. Yeah? Hey, dads, come up here. Grab your bottle. Come on. It's your day. No halos for us. Just a bottle of root beer. That's all, we, that's all we get for all the good things that we do that we don't get any credit for because we don't want any. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. You know what? You know what? Let's, do, let's do this. Huh? Grab, your, grab your bottle. And... Can we have a toast here in the church? Can we do that? And let the mothers watch all of us 
make a fool of ourselves in front of God? It's your day. It's our day today. Dads don't need halos, but we can spend just a little bit of time. Can I actually open this without... All right, let me see if I can. See if you can open your bottles to our wives, to our children, to our God. You're here. Happy Father's Day, dads. Happy Father's Day, fellas. Father God, it is, this is your world, and thank you so much for putting us in it. And thank you for our fathers, oh God, that you have gifted our families with. Bless our fathers today and every day as they continue to do what they do best under your lordship, with your guidance, in humility. And bless all of us today as well, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.